and eight. So, yeah. so yeah, we are on level 24, which is puzzle. Now, this one was uh, this is interesting. I wouldn't say it's the most complicated that we've run into in the past, but it's it's a, it's pretty complicated. You could tell by the good old seven out of ten here. Um, but the thing that I found the most difficult was actually understanding the logical steps needed to be taken to solve this challenge. So it's not necessarily the complexity of the challenge itself, but the number of steps that need to be taken and how you try to how you have to kind of keep that all in your head or on a piece of paper. So this challenge is called Puzzle Wallet, and this is all around DeFi or kind of centered around DeFi. Now, I'm not going to read this entire thing to you, uh, but we'll focus on the last piece that actually matters to us. So the goal for this contract is for us to hijack the wallet and to become the admin of the proxy. That's the goal here. Now, there's a few things that would be useful to understand that they highlight. So one here is understanding what delegate, delegate calls are, um, how they function. Also understanding how the sender and the value behave when going through this delegate call. And then obviously a really important piece to this is understanding proxying patterns and really just understanding proxies more generally. So, you know, what is a proxy and how does it function? Now, if we look at the code below here, we'll see that this is a bit lengthier than we've had in the past. Uh, you can see this is basically two contracts that are concatenated together in the same kind of bit of code. And that is, that is it there. So we basically, we need to take control of this contract. That is, that is our mission. So here are my notes. Uh, there's a lot of notes in here, uh, things that I had to basically wrestle with to understand further, both within solving the challenge directly and also adjacent topics that were relevant for the challenge. So the three solutions that I came across that I found semi-useful, um, this one is actually quite a, a good surprise. So this individual made a video um, talking through the specific challenge and I think they've done probably the best job out of all the solutions I've seen when walking through uh, logically how to understand the code and also weaknesses inside of it and also the security mechanisms inside of the code that prevent us from doing other types of attacks instead of the one that we ended up with. Um, so I highly recommend going to watch this video. I'll link it in my video. Um, kudos to this person. I think they, they deserve some more eyes on this video and probably their channel. So that was one good solution. The solution that I used was this one uh, from Coder Questions. So we've used their solutions in the past. I found this one to be uh, the most intuitive for me to understand. And I feel like the most straightforward to solve the problem. Um, but I highly recommend combining this video with this solution if you want to kind of at least get a, a more thorough understanding of how this is solved and why, why it's a weakness in the first place. And then I came across this solution here, which I found useful to understand one specific piece of the overall challenge. Um, you can see this was traditionally in Vietnamese, but I had to translate it to English. Um, but the one piece that I'll highlight later on uh, was basically the first step of solving the challenge. So we'll, we'll skip that for now. Um, so those are the three solutions that I came across, uh, all of which I thought were somewhat useful. So I'll share them with you. All right, so the next piece here in my notes is basically the things that we need to understand. So I've already talked through some of this, but we'll highlight some bits here. So first and foremost is understanding proxy contracts. Now, the a proxy contract is broken into two pieces. So one piece is the proxy contract and the other is the logic contract. The difference between these is the proxy contract basically houses the data. That's where all the data is housed. That's where your, your, uh, your state variables are and things like that. So the logic contract uh, contains the logic. So that's usually the lengthier contract that has all the functions that are going to be doing what they're going to be doing. Um, with these, this contract here is the one that changes over time. So the purpose of proxy contracts, which is something we've discussed in previous challenges and also I think in the Securian Bootcamp, the premise of a pro proxy contract is basically allowing the contract to be upgradable. And I think we can skip, yeah, let's skip down. Let's skip straight to that. So here's some stuff here that I've uh, pulled from previous challenges that we've had, we've gone through together. And you can see this simple diagram that kind of gives you an idea of the, the premise of an upgradable contract. So you have a series of users and you have your proxy contract. Well, say you're using this implementation of the contract. This is the logic piece, right? So logic, and this is gonna be uh, your proxy contract, which remember holds the state, which is the storage and the data and all that stuff. 
Um, so if we have these two things going on here, uh, this contract here, the old one, maybe it has a bug. Maybe there's some sort of flaw inside of it that could allow it to be exploited and all the money siphoned out. So we don't want to use this contract anymore. We want to move to an upgraded contract and we've upgraded the bugs and we've, we've improved the fixes. So say we've created this new contract, this new implementation, and we've deployed it. So now we can basically divert all this traffic that's coming through this proxy contract into this new logical contract and then either switch everybody over at once or slowly trickle them over. I'm not sure um, if there are multiple implementations of this like you would do with a, with a load balancer inside of like a cloud, a cloud instance or a cloud infrastructure. But if it is, then there's different ways you can do that or many ways. But anywho, um, that's the premise, right? We can upgrade our contracts over time. And what we're doing is we're upgrading the logic here and we're uh, sustaining the state. And we're keeping that the same. Now, with all this being stated, We'll go back up here and actually let me come down here and point out one more piece. So I've talked about this in previous videos, um, but it's really important to understand that there are flaws in this, this approach. So I will link this uh, article here to walk you through um, some of the potential downsides of proxy contracts, um, just so you can get an understanding of what those are. And this piece here, uh, I will talk about this when I talk about the code, because there are certain aspects of the constructor inside of the proxy contract I didn't understand and I had to Google, um, but I'll talk about that later. So here we've talked about, I think everything I wanted to here. So our proxy contract is going to be labeled puzzle proxy. And then our logical contract is going to be called puzzle wallet. We're going to interact with this piece here, the puzzle wallet, because that is the contract. That's what everybody interacts with because that's what contains the logic. So that's what our ABI is going to expose to us. Now for the storage slots, this is a common issue that I've come across in research I've done on this topic for proxy contracts when it comes to security, is that within proxy contracts, uh, one common issue is actually, uh, they call it, uh, I think it's storage collisions or slot collisions or something like that, where basically um, inside of your proxy and inside of your logical contract, you may have some storage in there. And remember, with storage, they're stored in slots. So we have slot one, slot two, slot uh, one, zero, one, two. Um, so say this is our proxy contract and this is our logical contract. So we have zero, one, two. Now, uh, lot, the logical contract should mimic the proxy contract to a certain point. So if in slot uh, zero, uh, zero, we have A, in slot one, we have B, and then slot two, we have C, then actually we'll just say there's nothing in slot two for this one. So we'll just ignore that piece. Undo, 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 undo. Go away. All right, so that didn't work. So we're just going to scratch it out. All right, ignore that. So say we're say slot two is empty. So for uh, the logical piece, uh, slot zero has to have A. So it should have A and it should have B. But if either of those are not correct, so if those are swapped around and you say that zero, the zero has B and this has A, then what's gonna happen is that if we write anything to this uh, state variable, so if we change this at all, if we have the power to do so in that contract we have access to, then what's going to happen is this B is automatically going to write over this A and it's going to write whatever we put inside of that input. And the same applies here. So this is actually going to interpret things incorrectly because we've interpreted the state variables that are provided us to it incorrectly. And that leads to collisions in the storage and that can lead to us actually taking advantage of the contract and uh, being very bad with it. So that's, that's a important thing to understand. And then the last thing here is delegate calls. So we'll take advantage of some delegate here I don't think there's not much to explain here when it comes to the exploit because most of the exploit is going to sit within these two here the proxy contract and the, the collision um, but we will leverage the, the delegate call and we'll have to manipulate this a bit um, to do some interesting uh, multi calls so we'll stop there those are the things you'll understand those are the things that I'll link to in the video description but at a high level those are the three main things so proxy contracts um, slot collisions and delegate calls. Those are the things you need to interpret to solve this challenge. So for delegate calls, uh, I'll quickly show you uh, these two images that I've shown in the previous videos just to get an intuitive understanding of what a delegate call is. Um, if you could basically separate it out and you can say that it's a call that delegates things, like just say, say it in reverse and, and separate it out and it makes it easier. Um, here you can see that we have two different types of calls in these images. I have a call, like a regular call at the top and I have a delegate call at the bottom. So if we look at the uh, regular call, we'll see that when we have an EOA, which is a human, so this is an externally owned account, they're gonna make a call to a contract. This contract is then gonna see there's a sender, who's our EOA, and they're gonna see the value was provided by our EOA. So if this caller contract 
has to call another contract, the end, the end contract, the target contract to do something for this EOA, what's going to happen is when they make this secondary call, it's actually going to change the sender to the caller and it's going to change the value to what the caller provided in that value here. Now, the reason that's happening is because within the traditional call, it's taking the most recent call and it's not taking anything between that. There's no relays. So that's kind of the premise of a regular call. But if we do a delegate call, which is basically delegating the call that we've asked it to shoot, um, we can see that we have EOA, we have our call coming into this first contract. That's going to send it off to the next contract. And you can see this is where the delegate call is happening. And the reason we can see that is we can see the sender here is the EOA. We can see the value is their EOA, but also that's the same here. So the sender is still the EOA and the value is still what the EOA asked for. Because this contract here, this color contract, is basically just a throughput. We're, we're going we're gonna to send right through this color contract, enter the next contract to get what we want, and then get it back to us. So this is basically just a, a, a relay for us. So it's not necessarily going to change anything. And that's kind of the premise of a delegate call. And um, another thing I have in here is slot storage. So I've talked about slot storage above. Uh, I've talked about this in all the other videos, so I'm going to kind of be quick with this because I've talked about everything twice, basically, or three times. Um, so slot storage, how does it function and what does it look like? How's it laid out? So this video I've linked uh, here that I'll share with you. This is a really good video from Smart Contract Programmer first. And then this is a blog that kind of walks you more through it. I'll link both of those. But in a, in a nutshell, we can see that there are different slots. So you can see this is slot zero. This is slot one. This is going to be slot two. And this here is going to be slot three. Now, each of these uh, slots contain uh, 36 bytes or 256 bits. So this 256 is bits, so that's that's bits with a B I T S, and then the 32 bytes here you can see is B Y T S. So that's kind of the premise there. And with that being stated, when you put something in there, such as uh, a specified size, so you can see that the first slot zero is color purple, so we're doing color coordination. This byte 32 foo, we're stating that as 32 bytes. So no matter what we put in here, it's going to take up all the space. The next thing is the same premise, so var is the same thing, so that's going to be 32 bytes, it's going to take up the entire slot. And then down here we can see the uint num, this is automatically going to default to 256, so anytime that you use your uint, it's automatically going to be 256. So this 256 here is going to be there, and it's going to take up the entire thing. But we can see that it's only actually used this end piece here. Everything else is padded out with zeros. And then we have our last one, which is an address, so we can see that here. And that address is only going to take up half of those 32 bytes. So that's going to be 16 bytes or I think it's 64 bits or something like that. And then this Boolean is only going to take up uh, two bits uh, or one byte. And that's going to be that zero one here. And when we have two uh, variables or two state, yeah, two state variables are putting into a contract slot, if they're both small enough to fit in there, then we're going to switch them together to save on gas. And that's what's happening here with these two. That's kind of how things are laid out in slots. And I think those are all the notes that I wanted to share with you and things you should understand. Um, below that, I've actually had to basically write out the phases of the attack, the different steps and things to consider, because there are multiple steps to this that I that I want to explain and I don't want to miss out on. Um, so we'll come to that when we'll come to that. So we'll come to that when we're running the attack. But before we do that, as per usual, we're going to step through the code. Now, the code here is quite hefty, and we are going to take it one step at a time. So with the code here, we'll start at the top. So the, remember the top is going to be a smaller contract that holds the state. So first things first is we have our uh, pragma stuff going on here. So we have our 6.0 version. So remember, this should be 8.0, and this shouldn't be floating point. Um, the Pragma experimental piece, so this is just the ABI encoder v2, so this is in relation to the ABI. Not sure if this is necessary, but we'll leave it. Um, we have two import statements. So we have safe math, which we're going to use later. Remember, this is good for preventing uh, underflows and uh, overflows, but that's no longer relevant, I think, beyond 8.0. Um, upgradable proxy. So this is where the magic happens. So we're going to import this from Open Zeppelin so we can actually have the upgradable proxy available. And then we have our contract. So this contract here is a puzzle proxy, and it's going to inherit the uh, methods incorporated into the upgrade proxy we've imported here. And remember, this, this puzzle proxy is going to be our shorter contract that stores uh, state and, and data. 
So this is going to be labeled as our proxy contract that has the state and storage inside of it. So below this, we have some state variables, and that's what we're holding here. So we have the pending admin and admin, so these are both the addresses. Down here we have a constructor. So I have some notes here I've added, and this correlates to the point that I made earlier um, in the notes that I skipped over that we'll jump to in a second right now. So I've linked two links here and here that I had to Google. Reason being is that if we look at this constructor, we can see that it's taking in a few items that I understand, but one I didn't. So this here, they're taking this input in, which is admin, and that's going to be the address. So the person that deploys this contract, this initial state contract that's holding all the data, they're going to be the admin of the contract. We're going to want, this is the goal. We want to take that. That's, we, want that we want that to be us. Um, we have our implementation. So this address here is actually the contract below. So down here, way down here, there's a contract, and that contract is our logical contract that has all the functions inside of it. And that's what this is pointing to here. And then the thing after that is what I had to Google. So after that, we can see that there's a bytes memory and it's taking the init data. So I was like, what in the hell is init data? Well, simply put, the init data is basically uh, when you use delegate call, data is passed from the proxy contract um, onto the logical contract. So when we interact with this contract here and we interact with the logical contract below, when we, when we set data variables, so when we set, set slot zero and we set slot one below, it needs to be funneled through this parameter here. So then we can input it into these, uh, these state variables. Um, found that out through Googling. So I found that the, the original EIP, so the Ethereum uh, improvement proposal, it walks you through specifically what that is. And then also you can find it in the documentation here where it kind of walks you through what that, uh, that data actually does and its purpose. Groovy. All right. So next we have a modifier. So this modifier is simply saying that only the admin can do things. So we're going to say, you know, the admin has to equal the sender. If so, then continue. And then we'll come down here. We have a proposed new admin. So this, there is no modifier here, which is nice. So that means that we can interact with this. That's good. Um, so this is basically, I want to propose a new admin. So I want to say, I want to add myself as the admin. So I'm going to put my address here and then it's going to pop it into this variable. Um, and then it's going to put that up in the state variable that we've already discussed. Uh, here we have an approve new admin. So this is uh, only accessible by the admin because it has this modifier here that we just discussed up here. And it's basically stating that um, I'm going to propose uh, an expected admin. No, this is going to take the expected admin. Approve new admin, expected admin. Yeah, okay. So, okay, sorry, this makes sense. All right. Um, so I've proposed a new admin. Let's clear this out. So I've proposed a new admin here. And the expected admin should be the pending admin because if I want to, I, I want to approve only things that are inside of the proposed admin state variable. So I'm going to say I want to, I want to approve the expected admin, which will be this, and it's going to say, okay, as long as this equals this, then we're good. If not, then it's the wrong thing. Um, if it does equal that, then we're going to take, we're going to take that pending admin, and we're going to add them to the admin, and they'll be that. Admin. Um, below here we have upgrade two. So this is actually uh, an interesting function that allows you to upgrade your contract. So we've talked about upgrading contracts and proxy contracts and upgradability and stuff like that. Well, if you want to upgrade your contract, you actually just all you have to do is put in the new address for that new implementation and then point this proxy contract to that new logical contract that has all those new functions and those bugs that are fixed. And that's what's happening here. You can see this has a modifier on it, so only the admin can do that. And it's going to take that new address and it's going to then um, run that method here, upgrade to which is in accordance to the thing that we imported up there for um, Open Zeppelin. So that is our first contract. So below here, we have our puzzle wallet. So this puzzle wallet is where all the logic happens, and this is what we're going to interact with most is where magic happens. So we have our contract. It's going to uh, use safe math, so we can use that on. Um, we have an address here for owner, and we have the uh, uint value for max balance. So the important thing to point out here so remember above in the contract we just discussed, their slot zero was pending admin and their slot one was admin. So this is where the collision occurs. This shouldn't be this case. This should be pending admin instead, and then this should be admin instead, but it's not. So since they've made that mistake, we can take advantage of that. And that's what we're going to take advantage of here. Uh, we have some mapping. So we have a mapping for a whitelist. So whitelisted uh, addresses, so people that can do things. Um, we have another mapping here for balances, so seeing what the balance is for certain addresses. And then below here for the init. So this 
um, init is actually for upgradable logic, upgradable contracts. The init within those is actually the constructor. Um, it's not the legitimate constructor because the legitimate constructor is up there. We've already talked about it. Um, but here, this is basically what you use for your constructor when you're first initializing a logical contract that's tacked onto a proxy contract. Um, so that's what we're doing here. And when we initialize this contract, when we first deploy it, we're going to give it a max balance. And that max balance, uh, we can see some checks happening here. So if you try to set the max balance again or set the init again, um, it's going to do a requirement check here to ensure that you don't do that. And it's saying, okay, I want to ensure that the max balance equals to zero. If it's not, that means this has already been initialized and it's already up and deployed. Um, if not, then we're going to update that max balance and then the sender is going to become the owner. So this is the end game. So if we become the owner here, that means that we're then the, uh, we're then the potential pending admin and we can take over admin. So that's later on, but we'll discuss that in a second. So that's the init, um, only whitelisted. So this is another, another modifier. So this modifier is basically similar to the one we discussed above. So the sender, the person that originally uh, deploys this contract or the sender, that's not true. So whoever the sender is that's on the whitelisted uh, mapping that we've just talked about above, if you're on the whitelisted mapping and you, uh, yeah. So if you're on the whitelisted mapping, then you can pass this modifier. Um, then we can keep going. We have the set max balance, which has this modifier on it that we just talked about. So you have to be on that mapping to actually interact with this. Um, if you are on it, then what you can do is you can set the max balance only if the balance currently is zero. And that is a big issue here because currently when we check the ABI in the console, we'll see that this balance is set to, I think it's 0, uh, 0 0.001 ETH. And it, since that's the case, then we're unable to do anything. We're not allowed to really interact with this because the balance is already past zero. So that is the first issue that we're going to run into. Um, but if it wasn't, then we could update it. Uh, down here we have the add to whitelist. So this is something that we're going to do because there is no modifier. So we can add ourselves automatically to the whitelist, then just interact with these other functions, which is a big plus. Um, so we're going to add our address here and it's going to then say, okay, um, we'll require that the sender equals owner. So that is a check that we'll have to pass later on. Um, and then it'll allow us to add us ourselves to that whitelisted, um, that whitelisted address. Then we have deposit. So deposit is basically allowing us to deposit funds. So this is an external payable function. Uh, you have to be on the whitelisted modifier again, and it's going to basically ensure that the balance that you're trying to deposit, um, is below or equal to the max balance. So this is another hurdle we'll have to pass where basically if we want to deposit funds, we can't allow the, um, the contract to increase its internal accounting. So instead of actually depositing funds into this contract, we'll deposit funds to it, but instead of putting it into the balance that uh, adjusts its, its internal accounting, we'll actually divert that to ourselves. And we divide, divert it to ourselves. Um, this will stay the same, but we'll keep depositing. When we keep depositing, it'll allow us to eventually um, siphon off all the funds. A bit confusing, um, but hopefully it'll make sense a bit later on. Um, so we've, that was the issue there. Uh, then, so if that wasn't an issue and we had, and we deposited something that was less than or equal to the balance, what it's going to do is it's going to do that, uh, that safe math add with the value we provided. It's going to add that to the balance and then it's going to update it here. We have our execute function, which is basically siphoning off funds. And this is what we're going to use last so we can take all the money. And this execute one basically says, I want to send uh, the money to this address. I want to send this amount of money to it. And then I have uh, some bytes called data. So this, I think this call data piece is referring to memory. Um, and this is the data we can input. So this is a extra thing that we're going to take advantage of. External payable function, only whitelisted modifier again. So this is, this is ensuring that the, uh, the money that we want to send is money we have. So as long as our balance is greater than or equal to the value that we're sending, then we can send it. Uh, it's then going to subtract that value from our balance and then update it here. Uh, and then we can see that we have a call here. So this is going to be going to that address. We're going to call that address. We're going to send the value and then the additional data. And then it requires a success to be returned. And if not, then it fails. So that is the last piece there. And then this is the last bit of the contract. I know there's a lot of code here. I'm sorry, but just, just the way that it is. Um, all right. So this is an important piece of all the functions, the multi-call 
is the thing that we're going to exploit and take advantage of. Um, reason is that they've put in controls here to prevent us from doing things, but there is a, a round way of getting past it. So with this multi-call, what it's going to do is it's going to take call data. So the call data that are referred to here, something there, and this call data in here um, is basically going to go through a few different processes. So first off, we have this Boolean value. So this Boolean value is set to false immediately. The reason it's set to false is because what it wants to do is it wants to ensure that we don't deposit more than once with a transaction. So the reason this function exists, this multi-call function exists, is because it's what it's doing is it's counting up the transactions and it's batching them into a single batch to save on gas. So if I can batch all the transactions into a batch and then send it out, it's going to it's going to save gas instead of iterating. Um, but also with this multi-call, they don't want you to deposit multiple times because if you do it multiple times, they batch it up and then send it off. It's going to exceed the certain balance and um, it'll it'll break the contract or it'll allow us to get access to things we shouldn't have access to. Um, so here, that they put this control in place to prevent it from happening. Um, we have a for loop here. That's basically what it's going to do is it's going to read that data that you've sent it. So this data that we've sent, it's going to iterate through that data and read it and consume it. And as it goes through the iteration, it's going to take each bit of data, it's going to put it into this variable in memory. Um, it has a selector, a bytes for selector that it's going to compare itself to, because we can see here in this inline assembly, that's what this is, inline assembly. Um, we're going to take the data that you've sent. We're going to take 32, the 32 bytes of that. We're going to add that to your memory. So this is memory load. And then it's basically going to put this into this variable selector. So what it's going to check is going to say, okay, the deposit, so this, this dot deposit selector, which is up here, we've discussed this already. So let me go up here and show you. So in deposit here, it's checking the data, the value that we've sent. And when it does that check, it's going to say, as long as the deposit selector that we interacted with above matches the selector here, then we'll let you uh, follow through. And that's saying that I want to take the first four bytes of the function you've called above, which is deposit. I want to take that that random, you know, zero x whatever whatever that four the first four bytes of that function. I want to compare the two. And if you're calling the right function, I'll let you continue. Um, so then it has a requirement here. It says, okay, as long as the deposit called is uh, not false, which is what it is now. Um, then continue, and then we'll change the deposit to call true. So that allows you to kind of iterate through the entire thing. It does some stuff here, so it does our delegate call, calling that data um, into the other contract, and it's going to call it on this address. Uh, if it's success, it's good. Um, we have another requirement. If it's not a success, then it fails. So that was a lot of information, and I hope that was semi uh, understandable. Because if we really try to simplify this as much as possible, our goal here is basically to surpass this for loop and basically send in multiple deposits. That's our goal. We want to send multiple deposits into this for loop. And if we can do this, that means that we can actually um, exceed the original ETH limit. And if we can exceed this because we, we can surpass the requirement above, that's going to allow us then to extract everything. Because if we have 0 0.002 in there as ourselves, so me, I have this much ETH in there, and this is the, the total balance. So this is supposed to be the total balance, but it's not. I've secretly put in more. I can then extract out my stuff, but when I extract out my stuff, I'm actually extracting out their stuff too. So hopefully that was helpful. Um, okay, so that was the code. Now we are going to move on to a series of functions that are related to the answer. Now I've broken this out into, into a few chunks. So you can see that I've numbered each of these. So this here is step one, step two, step three, step four. So we'll walk through each of those steps together. Um, but as we do that, I think what I'm going to do to hopefully make this a bit more understandable, let's open that one back up, close this one, open our notes is I'm going to walk you through my steps here. And we're going to walk through the code with the steps side by side. So you can understand both the text as well as the, the, the function itself. So the first step here is to understand the storage layout. We understand that we've already talked about the mistakes there. So we can check this off. The next piece is going to be basically exploiting the, the pending admin slot. So we can do this because it allows us to. Because remember, up here in this code for this, this wall that we interact with, um, we can change 
both of these because we can interact with them. So if we set the owner to our address, what it's going to do is it's going to set the pending variable to our ad to our address. When we set it to pending, that means that we can come down here and we can actually um, we can uh, set the set ourselves into the whitelist, and then that would allow us to interact with other things. Alrighty, so um, yeah, so we're going to exploit the pending admin piece. So we're going to add ourselves here to be used for later on. And then after we do that, we're going to whitelist ourselves because we'll have access to that easily. So let's actually walk through this together um, in the console. So I'm going to take this, this here, which I pulled from this answer here, and I'm going to drop it into our contract. And quickly, I'll just show you here the ABI that we have access to, so you don't think I'm lying. Um, here you can see we basically all the functions and state variables that we discussed previously are all associated to that logical contract and association to the proxy. So we're going to basically make a variable here, and that variable is going to be function signature, um, et cetera, et cetera. And what's happening here, let's uh, put this here. What's happening with this code is basically we're going to create a variable called function signature. And this is basically taking the function name of proposed admin or the state variable admin. This is what we're going to add ourselves to because we have access to this through, I think it's through this variable here. So if we add our address here, then it's going to be put in here. And this is a function that we're uh, asking to propose a new admin for. The inputs are going to be our address and the name of new admin. So that's the, that's what we're going to encode here. And that's what we've encoded there here. So once we've done that, we're then going to simply add the player to the whitelist so we can actually interact with things. So remember up here, we have this only whitelist modifier. So if we're added to this mapping here for whitelist, that means that we can interact with all the functions below that include this modifier, which is important for us to interact with certain functions. So with that being stated, we will do that here. So I'm going to add myself to the mapping. Everything goes well, I won't get any errors. As that's loading, we will talk about more code. So the next piece here is interesting. So we'll expand this out and talk about this a bit more. Uh, oh, that was, that was weird. I'm going to do that. <gasps> we got an error. Oh, no. Okay. We got an error because I didn't follow the instructions correctly. Don't do what I did. Whatever you do, Internet. So to correctly do this, we do this parameter first. So we set this up for the proposed admin. We put our address in there for the, for the voting. We then take the player and we're going to add them to another variable, which is params. So the reason we're doing this is simply so we can concatenate all this together to then inject it into a transaction. Um, the next piece here is we're going to take the data, uh, or not take the data, we're going to take the function signature as well as that. So let's open this up so you can see it. Um, so here we're going, to do, we're going to do two things. So we're going to take this param, which is our address. We're going to take this function signature, which is basically the first four bytes of this proposed admin here. And we're going to concatenate them together through the encoding function call here through Web3.js. So we're going to take that and that and put them together into this variable here. So let's do that so I don't forget. Because um, it's easy to forget and make mistakes. Okay, so that is what we needed to do. And here you can actually see, if I take this out of here and put it here. What you'll see here is basically this bit here, the a to the six, this is the first four bytes of this function here, for the proposed new admin. And then from here to here is going to be the player's address. And that's gonna be my address. So we've concatenated them together and encoded it. So the next step here is going to be uh, sending a transaction. And to send this in a transaction, what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna combine all that stuff together. So we're gonna take basically the from section, so we're going to say from this player to this instance, um, and then we're going to send this data. And the data is basically this data here. So we're going to push this in here, and we're going to go from here to here. And that's basically going to say that I want to add this address to the proposed admin, admin function. So if we go back, oh no, if we go back here. We're just going to keep doing stuff and hopefully not get any errors because this is the way I understand it and it should work. All right, so this is still loading. I'm going to explain the next piece. So step three, what we're going to do is after we've done this transaction, we've added ourselves into the pending admin piece. Now we're going to add ourselves to the whitelist as I falsely explained earlier and was wrong. 
So this is when we add ourselves to the whitelist because we are now um, in the pending admin state, so we should be able to actually do that. So this, okay, this successfully landed. That's what we want. We're gonna add ourselves to the uh, whitelist. And when we add ourselves to the whitelist, remember it's gonna allow us to interact with functions that have that modifier on it. And then below here, we'll talk some about some more stuff. So what we wanna do here is we wanna do the, uh, it's like an inception thing that's gonna happen here. So I'll explain what's happening, then I'll show you a chart that's helpful. So first we're gonna take the deposit method, and we're gonna put it into a variable. So we're gonna say, okay, uh, await contract out methods. I'm gonna have the deposit name, and I'm gonna request dot then. So this is, I think, just pulling back the data from that deposit and then putting it into this variable. And then we have a multi-call data. And this variable is basically gonna do uh, the multi-call uh, data name and the contract above that we've already talked about. It's gonna take that name. And it's gonna request this data set that here, so this deposit, so we're gonna, in, we're gonna input that here as well. And they're gonna say the not data, we're gonna put this into multi-call data. So what we've done there is we've basically just created a multi-call within a multi-call. Because what we're gonna do next is we're gonna take the same variable we just created and we're gonna put it in here but we're gonna put it in there twice. You can see it put in there twice. And then we're gonna set the value of uh, zero dot way, and it's gonna then bump this up to zero zero two instead of zero zero one, allowing us to extract ours out and then extract theirs out as well. Now, the reason we're doing this, and this chart should be useful, because it's kind of helpful for me. Uh, where is it? Oh no, internet, where did I put the chart? Oh, it's down here. All right. You know, it's not like groundbreaking chart, but it helps. So multi-call that we're going to make, remember, have two multi-calls in that input parameter. And when those two multi-call those two multi-calls have two deposits in them. So that means that we're basically calling deposits with multi-call. So we're bypassing the check that was actually baked into the code originally. So this bit of code here that I talked through, we're going to call this once, but inside of this, is inception multi-calls because we've encompassed two multi-calls here so we're basically going to do two deposits simultaneously bypassing this uh this initial check this boolean of false so we can then deposit doubly and uh you know run away with the money all right so we're going to take the deposit and hopefully everything is still working on the console cool it is no errors we're doing great internet so we're gonna take that, we're gonna take that uh, name and we're gonna take the first four bytes of that from that name. We're gonna do the same thing here, I think. Yeah, so we've taken, what did we do here? Interesting. We requested the data and we've added the multi-call. So I think this here and this here are confusing. One of these is referring to the first four bytes of this. The other one is a mystery, <laughs> but we like mysteries. All right, so after we've done that, we're then going to do the inception call. So remember this call that we're making, so we're gonna call multi-call, actually this is probably, this is a good way to show this. Look at us, making strides, teaching stuff. So we're calling multi-call once, which is right here. And then inside of this input parameter, we're gonna have two multi-calls. And those two multi-calls are gonna help us bypass this product here and allow us to deposit uh, more than we should. And actually, I think in the blog post, we can get the balance of the address. Yeah, let's get the balance of the address and see what it is. Ah, see it's two. We've upped it to two. So now if we extract that as we want, then we get all the monies. So what we're doing here, what I've just copied and pasted in there is the execute call, which we've already talked about. So this is basically allowing us to extract money out. So we're gonna say from this address for this amount of money to this address. And now the to address is going to be basically a, a, zero, a zero dot address. And that's going to allow us to um, send all the money to a bogus address and empty this contract. And the amount of money we're taking is two, so we can extract all the one and we'll get all the money out. So this didn't fail, which is a bonus. And now, after we've executed that money and after we've sent the 
two way to a bogus address and it just it's a burner address and disappeared then this uh, address should be empty and if it's empty the reason we're going to set max balance is because that means that we can actually set the balance and become admin so if we come back up here we'll see that the set balance here right here the set balance when we set this we're going to set the admin instead of setting the balance so if we come down to set balance, let's actually open this up so you can see what I'm talking about. So we've just called set balance and we said, okay, I want to set the balance and I want to set it to the player's address. And that in turn is saying that I would want to take this variable, add it here, and that is then going to give us admin. And the reason we're able to pass this and, and pass this requirement that initially blocked us previously is because we just siphoned out the entire contract and the contract is zero now. So that means we pass this requirement. The balance of the contract is zero. So that allows us to update this and make ourselves admin. So this has not failed either. And that means that we're doing things correctly. So in the end, if we submit the instance and it doesn't error out, that means that we passed a challenge. So internet, this is a long video. Very convoluted, tons of notes, tons of points to make, but hopefully it was helpful, insightful, and I will see you on level 25, which is motorbike, one of the two levels away from finishing the series. So excited.